Extending beyond the work energy theorem from the previous chapter, we're going to introduce what's probably the most useful idea in science generally, the conservation of energy. So there is a quantity um, that is present in Newton's laws of motion, but was not immediately appreciated as being there. Um, there are certain symmetries that certain forces will have that allows you to ignore uh, their vector nature and instead deal with a scalar, the energy associated with a force. Um, so that's what we want to develop in, in this chapter. And as a way of motivating the discussion, we could figure out how fast this roller coaster cart is going based on uh, it started at a particular place and it had some initial velocity. And we know uh, or can compute what the angle of the track it is track is at any point along this track. And so we're just going to go through and integrate the equations of motion forward in time. And that could get us what the speed of this uh, card is at this particular instant. And then the speed at this instant will tell us what the speed is at the next instant when it's further along on the track. Um, we could do it that way. In fact, you could even run it backwards. So you could start from here and uh, if we know its velocity here, we reverse that and then we would run it all the way back and it would come back to rest just right at the starting point. Um, so that all works. That is really difficult way of doing things. It's much easier if we just use energy. Uh, if friction is negligible or it's small, or even if it isn't, um, we could have work done by the force of friction, uh, but all of the effects out of gravity, we can take into account just knowing how high the cart is at a particular point in time. And that's a, that's a great simplification. All right, so you mentioned that there's a certain symmetry that uh, certain kinds of forces have, uh, and that is the idea of a conservative force. So I'm going to try to be clear about what a conservative force means. So I'm going to have some particle, and it's going to execute motion along a path that begins and ends at the same point. So there is the initial point of the particle, and then it just went in a cycle. So it comes back and ends at the same place that it started. If the force that is doing work is a conservative force, then it can't do any network along a closed cycle. Whatever work was done along one part of the cycle is going to be undone by the other part of the cycle because if I end back at the same place that I started, I have to be at the same uh, amount of work done by this conservative force. So that's one way to think about a conservative force, that along a closed path, the work done by the force is zero if it's conservative. Another way to think about a conservative force is instead of having a closed cycle, uh, we're going to consider uh, paths that just have an initial point and some final point. So there's my end, end of the final point, and start at the initial point. Um, so there's one path going from initial to final. So there's an arrow to indicate that that's the way it went. And here's another path. And I could instead follow that path. And I can just keep adding them in, right? As long as the path begins at I and ends at F, if the force is a conservative force, then it's going to do the same amount of work. Okay. So that's the other way to think about it. 
um, if the path is a closed cycle, a conservative force will do no network. If the uh, path is not a closed cycle, it has a distinct initial and final point, then the conservative force is going to do uh, the same amount of work regardless of the path that I take. All right, so let me clean that up. Right. And now let's actually define things. So if we have a force that is conservative, uh, then we're going to define a new quantity called the potential energy, and it is defined up to an arbitrary constant because it's coming from an integration, right? So when you're doing your uh, indefinite integrals, um, the resulting integral is going to be uh, defined up to an additive constant. Same thing for potential. The only thing that matters when we talk about energy is the change in energy. You are free to pick what you want the energy levels to be. All right, so the change of potential energy delta U is equal to minus the work done by a conservative force. And the work done by a force is the integral from starting position to ending position of the force as a function of position integrated over that uh, coordinate. So it's a little abstract, uh, but if I plop in a constant force of gravity pointing down, right, then I'm going to wind up with a gravitational potential energy, energy that just depends upon height, uh, where we're taking some level to be where height is zero. I'll have a positive gravitational potential energy if I'm above that, and I will have a negative gravitational potential energy if I'm below that. So I stick in a constant force, I will get a linear potential. If I stick in a linear force, so a force that follows Hooke's law, and then I integrate that, I'm going to wind up with a potential that is quadratic. Uh, and that is uh, the elastic potential energy. So these are, for right now, two really good prototypes for a conservative force the force by a spring doesn't depend upon anything I do, like stretching and compressing, stretching and compressing. All that matters is the work done by that spring force is going to be what it was initially and what it was in the final state. It's an ideal spring. It has no memory of anything that happened in between. If it's uh, gravity that we're talking about, gravitational potential energy, uh, if we're talking about changes in height, small compared to the size of the earth, then it doesn't matter how many times I go up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. All that matters is where I started at, which this equation is taking that to be zero, and where I end, which is the coordinate y. Then another thing I want to mention before moving on from this slide, there's only one coordinate in here in the elastic potential energy for a spring because we have agreed to measure the elastic potential energy stored in the spring relative to a starting point uh, that was the equilibrium length of the spring. So it's not storing energy, any energy at that point, but if I compress it or stretch it from that point by an amount X, then uh, it will be storing some energy. And it doesn't matter whether it's compression or stretching. Um, if I compress an ideal spring by a centimeter or I stretch an ideal spring by a centimeter relative to its equilibrium length, you're storing the same amount of energy in it. All right. Let's do some examples to practice our ideas here. Um, so Larry has a gravitational potential energy of 1,870 joules as he is sitting 2.2 meters above the ground in a skydiving airplane. Then the airplane takes off. What is his gravitational potential energy when he begins to jump from the airplane at an altitude of 923 meters? So 
apply our ideas for gravitational potential energy. 923 meters is small compared to the rays of the Earth. So we have the simple expression. So work out um, what the gravitational potential energy is at the jump height, and then confer with your physics friends, and then um, unpause the video, and we'll go over the answer. All right, so answer was E, a little bit of rounding to get to 7.85 uh, times 10 to the fifth joules. So the initial gravitational potential energy relative to a height of 2.2 meters lets you work out what mg is. Uh, it's the same mg when the person is up in the airplane. So you just multiply that by 923, and it'll come out to that 785,000 joules. Uh, and then as the person falls, that gravitational potential energy is going to become kinetic energy. All right. Within conservation of energy, there is a subset of energies that are called mechanical energy. So if only conservative forces are doing work, then we can keep track of a mechanical energy as the kinetic plus the potential. And if only conservative forces are doing work, then that sum of kinetic plus potential energy is constant. It's probably what you have thought of as conservation of mechanical energy beforehand. We're being a little bit more careful with different types of energy and where energy can go. So, if only conservative forces are doing work, like happy child on the swing, right, then we can say that, for example, as kinetic energy is increasing, the potential energy is decreasing. Uh, and then as the person is swinging back up, they're gonna go slower and slower, their kinetic energy is gonna go to zero and the potential energy is getting greater and greater. So the person swinging on the swing, the happy little girl, all that that is, is an exchange of uh, kinetic energy at their lowest point into potential energy at their highest point, and then back down again. Just changing kinetic into potential and potential back into kinetic. And if there is no work done by friction, that's all that can ever happen. I'm just going to swing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth forever. Then just expanding out, uh, change in a variable means final minus initial. So mechanical energy of the final minus mechanical energy of the initial is kinetic energy difference plus potential energy difference. Um, there obviously are like forces on her. Like there's a force, normal force from the swing, and that is actually coming from tension from the ropes. Those forces are present but they're not doing any work. Um, those forces are going to be pointed perpendicular to the displacement of the swing, so they can't do any work. So even though those other forces are acting, they're there in the free body diagram, the only force that is doing work is gravity. Gravity is a conservative force. So we can talk about mechanical energy being conserved. All right, let's try some examples with mechanical energy. Uh, after an ice storm, ice falls from the top floors of a 65-story building. Yikes. Uh, ice falls freely under the influence of gravity. Which one of the following statements concerning the situation is true? Nor are any effects due to non-conservative forces. So the way of saying that you'll see sometimes in this class is uh, assume that conservative forces do no work. All right, so read through those. Talk it over with your physics neighbor, and then once you've come to consensus, um, let's talk about what the answer is. All right, so the kinetic energy as the ice falls is going to increase in equal intervals in energy as it falls equal distances. So I'm trading off gravitational potential energy, which is decreasing, becoming kinetic energy. Uh, gravitational potential energy is mg times the height y. Uh, so equal intervals in height. 
are going to be equal intervals in kinetic energy. So it's not equal times. So the longer the ice falls, the faster it goes. Uh, potential energy can't decrease for equal times for the same reason. Total energy, the block increases. Um, well, doesn't Total energy isn't changing, just exchanging gravitational potential for kinetic energy. Uh, and as the block falls, the network done by all the forces acting on the ice is zero joules. No, gravity is doing work. All right, let's try another one. A roller coaster travels down a hill and is moving at 18 meters per second as it passes through a section of straight horizontal track. The car then travels up another hill that has a maximum height of 15 meters. If frictional effects are ignored, so only conservative forces are doing work, determine whether the car can reach the top of the hill. If it does reach the top, what is the speed of the car at the top? So try to work that out. Uh, and compare your answer with your neighbor. And then after you've reached consensus, let's go over the answer in the video. All right, so the car makes it to the top, and at the top it will be going 13 meters per second. Um, a way to see that and this straight section of track, you have an initial kinetic energy, and that's why I'm taking the potential to be zero. So there's an initial kinetic energy, and that's going to become a final potential energy. And it could also have a final kinetic energy. I don't know anything a priori to say that that's zero then all of these terms are proportional to a mass. So the mass cancels out, so you don't need to know it. Uh, you have an initial kinetic energy after the mass cancels out. It's going to be a half, 18 meters per second quantity squared. This is going to be G, which is about 10, times a height of 15 meters. So 10 times 15 is less than 18 squared. So it will make it up the hill. And then being more careful, we can work out whether it was nine or 13 meters per second. And it was 13 meters per second at the top. All right.